Welcome to another episode of All Things Entrepreneur, where we focus on shining the light on the blind side of entrepreneurship. It's your boy, Errol J. Allen, with... Jessica Myers. How are you doing today? Oh, I stay living the dream. Awesome. But how are you feeling? Blessed and highly favored. So today, guys, we have a dynamic duo who's been in the fintech space for the past two decades, wow. has multiple startups and exits. And without further ado, let's just get straight into it. Steve and Walter, how y'all doing today? Great, wonderful, <laughs> happy to be here. That was a great so intro. Much. Thank you, thank you. We do what we can with what we get. We talking about multiple exits while we give intros. I love it, I love it. <laughs> so let's just jump straight into it. So tell us like, that would happen at the beginning of the episode. Anyway, let's just jump straight into it. So how did you guys decide to get into the FinTech space? Why FinTech? Well, for me, I, I, I kind of got in there accidentally, I guess you'd say. I, uh, um, my buddies uh, were like, hey, we're gonna start this company up. We wanna do uh, personal finance management. We think everybody needs to help with personal finance management. Now, fast forward, this is back in like, you know, 2002, 2003, economy was pretty robust after the bust of 99. And, and I was like, well, who, who's doing that? Like, who's really managing this stuff? And he's like, no, they, all these kids are coming out of college. They need help. Cause that was back when if you were in college, you could get a $5,000 credit card. They were just running up credit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they literally would, they'd sit there out there on and, you know, sign you up as you're walking through the, you know, the main campus. Welcome orientation. Yeah. yeah. Orientation got a, a and so credit they were card. Like, we're going to help all these people that got a college. We're going to help them, you know, refinance their loans so that they can, you know, have better financial success. And so that was like first Andre. So I was like literally the first investor in that company. I was like, all right, I'm in. You got me convinced. Let, let's do it, <laughs> uh, which was terrible and crazy at the time because they didn't have a good business plan at the time. But uh, we actually figured it out along the way. So that's how I just started there. And then um, two years later, uh, we got into the financial crisis of 2008 and uh, we were like, look, we're either going to make this company work or we're going to, uh, you know, go out of go out of business. And we had our investors and our family in and we we're like, no, nope, let's go make this thing work. And so that's when we locked it in. So then it was, you know, we had to take it to banks and credit unions and sell it in a white label version. So that was, that was, you know, we were full tilt into the financial technology business. Mm -hmm. I love it. Pivoting. Cause we had an episode where we talked about pivoting mm -hmm. and it's like, you pivoted in the midst where a lot of people gave up. Like even when I went back and looked at documentaries, cause I was in college during that time, but seeing people jump out the window just because of a financial crisis. Oh, yeah. But instead where people were looking like it's over, you were like, let's hunker down and go harder. Yeah. Even the board, the board was like, you know, look, you just got to tell people sometimes that, that, you know, they made a bad investment and, you know, you guys, you know, you did it, you, you did what you could and, you know, you need to fold this in. And, uh, we were like, no, we're not going to do that. And, I mean, we're going out, we're going to give it everything we got. Yeah. And, uh, it definitely took everything I got, we got. So, but I got a lot of pieces of my soul back now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, just so I know, what does fintech stand for? Like, what's the long version of it? Uh, financial technology. So, it's uh, um, it started out like you know, it was basically it's a you know companies that are thinking of you know some you know offering financial services that aren't from these Fortune five hundreds, these old traditional platforms that are not very innovative. And so it was for companies who are like, hey, I'm bringing modern innovation and technology to the forefront. And if you think like in the early 2000s, you know, mobile apps were really just kind of rolling out and started. And it was, you know, if you had a mobile app, we were the first PFM in the history to ever have a mobile app. What is wow. PFM? So personal finance management. Mm -hmm. So wow. that was at the time of mint.com. So mm -hmm. we were like competing with mint, which was hard because mint got 180 million and, you know, was bought by Intuit and all of that. So uh, it was it was tough times, but that's where we went from the consumer model into the white label version, uh, which is the pivot that you talk about to, you know, sell it directly into banks and credit unions. And what was great is the banks and credit unions got to name it to their members and customers so they could call it whatever they wanted. So all these customers would, you know, be able to you know manage their finances. And it also brought in aggregation so you could holistically look at all your financials wow. in, in one, you know, yeah. in, from your bank application, you could see your you know, Morgan Stanley accounts, you could see your spouse's accounts who might be a B of A or something along those lines. Yeah. So in terms of, um, and well, I want to hear from, I want to, you know, hear <laughs> oh, from, yeah. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. Can we, can Steve, we give a little, Steve's the talker. <laughs> no problem, but I definitely want to hear your story too. And, and, and more so how you guys came to be and, and the similar parallels. Yeah, absolutely. So I came actually from a little more of a classic method of coming up through a large business. So in the banking space or, banking technology space, right, FinTech, there's like three major players that can provide 90% of the services to all the banks and credit unions in the country. 
And so what I did is I actually worked for them and kind of came up through a career where I was actually managing partnerships and integration. So Steve's company at the time, they were doing PFM, right? Personal financial management. And what they needed was actually data from all the banks, all the credit unions they were selling to. The only way you did that back in the day was these long laborious types of, you know, service integrations that you had to build. What a lot of people don't understand is that technology for all the banks and credit unions, it's like 50 years old. Like the crux of it is all 50 years old, or if not more. Yeah. So before there was even tech. <laughs> before there was like APIs or people talking about integration or anything like that, right? So I actually met Steve through a partnership where I was managing, you know, his old company's partnership and uh, with a company called Jack Henry, which is where I was at. And over the last, you know, 17, 18 years, we became really, really good friends. And, uh, you know, kind of the crux of our business was and how we started off was like, you know, we're looking at the landscape of what we were doing. We're like, we should go do this on our own. Man. We know, we know all the players. We know the, we know the technology. We have really great relationships. Let's go after this together. I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it when a plan comes together. Yeah. Can we talk about your first successful exit? How did that go? Uh, that was tough. That was with uh, the personal finance management company, which is a company called GZO that ended up selling to Jack Henry Walt's uh, former company. So um, it was through a, a, a lot of pain and sweat. We, you know, like entrepreneurs do, we, we had to make the decision. Did we want to take private equity money? Um, we, we honestly gave away a little bit too much of the company in the beginning, but we went through 2008 and it was hard to survive and you had to, it was hard to get investors. So we had to give a little bit more than you would typically to incentivize in a normal market mm -hmm. um, to incentivize, to get them to invest. And so then, you know, when it came time to really start rolling, we, you know, the, the cash grew organically, but in the banking business, it can be tough to get people off the ground and launched and, and getting that going. So eventually we had made the decision either we were going to sell or, or try to raise private equity money and the private equity money. We didn't have enough shares to really do that or we to make it enticing working for them than working for ourselves. Yeah. Um, so then uh, Jack Henry came along and, you know, we were able to give us a, a price that, you know, was really good for our investors. And uh, we offered a nice return to our investors. And um, I didn't go work for Jack Henry. I, I, I went on to go deep dive into the payments business, which mm -hmm. is where I love and live and breathe now. Because I, I, when I was, um, so actually we, we were talking so much about, you know, the commercial side of what I do, but I'm actually building out a fintech app myself to create a three-sided marketplace. Okay. And that's one of the biggest things that I was thinking of. Like when you're so close to the baby, yeah. how do you sell off like, Give the arm, give the leg. Right. Like, I want to keep the heart. I want to keep the baby. Like, how did that feel? Or were you just like, bump it, I'll go build another no, one? I mean, I'll tell every entrepreneur when you're going through private equity pitches and you're sitting there and these are, you know, 150 page decks and everybody has their role and you're sitting there and these guys, are, you know, those private guys, super smart. They know how to diagnose a business, but they're sitting there and they're beating your baby up all day long. <laughs> it's, uh, hey, you got to have some tough skin because, you know, like they're telling you all Why you do this? your baby is and then they tell you that they want to buy it. So it's it's kind of tough. But, <laughs> but were they happy? Movie. Like after, you know, after you guys had some resolve, like you mentioned, the first exit was at least to make them whole, especially when doubting you during tough times. Yeah. Well, they all got a seven times return. So okay. It was, oh, it, well, yeah. it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so it was, yeah, it actually worked out great. Sir. Obama put in an awesome rule that, you know, if you're investing for five years you don't have to pay taxes so if you look at you know the fact that they got that and didn't have to pay any uh income taxes oh yeah pretty pretty needy capital gains it's pretty oh nice. yeah so oh, yeah. Worked out well it doesn't work out that well if you're in the business yeah. but it, it worked out well for the investors exactly not to yeah. pry too much but can we get some like numbers on this like how did that look if that's not prying too much or was there an NDA sign? I don't know. No, no, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a public number. Okay. Um it was a 37 million exit so Okay, awesome, awesome. So with you guys, actually, um, you all was not part of your first company together, right? You're on the current one right now, Next Move, right? Right, correct. Right. Okay, so how did the Next Move come to play? Well, actually, there was a couple in between, but Walt and I were always friends, and then he was a big part of the, I mean, how we got started, Walt was a big part of getting us in the partnership with that company to get to get things rolling. So we built a relationship, and then... Um, Walt went to work at this other company when he was doing amazing things. And then we ended up working for this company called Move Financial, which is a company backed by Bain Capital, A16Z, stuff along the lines of that. And that's where, uh, you know, we were, that was the first time we actually worked on the same team together. Yeah. And, and uh, we were working on deals together and killing it. It was a, it was a lot of fun. So we were like, we got to take this show on the road. Yeah. yeah. So question for both of y'all, partnerships. How do y'all go about hiring the right talent, bringing on people to the team? What are some key factors y'all look for when building out the teams? 
Wow, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think <clears throat> when we think about partnerships, um, Steve and I kind of lived and breathed and grew up in like channel partnerships, right? Really understanding the people. And I think the biggest important part of when you're looking at talent, when you're looking at the relationship itself, is um, is really understanding what the objectives and goals are that you have and finding a common ground, right? So um, Steve, when he was at GZO and he wanted to build up their product, right? And they're also relationships. What did he need? He needed exposure, but he also needed introductions. He needed not a, really a hand holding. He just needed to understand the ecosystem he was going to go play in, right? I knew that ecosystem extremely well. So the way that I could serve that partnership the best way possible was to help him where he needed to, to go. And so I think if you can find staff or people who you want to kind of do that kind of business with, you have to find those common grounds. If you're only doing it from a self-interest perspective, you're not going to be successful. So that, that's the way I kind of look at it. Yeah, I'd, I'd chime in on that. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, people talk about win-win, but they don't necessarily know how to do that. They, they stop at the phrase and don't follow through with the actual actions. And a lot of that is understanding, you know, what is it that that partner needs from you and what do you need so that you guys can really work together to build something that's successful and it, it does come down to money um you know like we had a guy we were working with who's bringing us some deals and he's like ah, i don't need any money it's like no we're going to give you money where this is how the partnership's going to work this is what we do for our partners we take care of our partners and so you have to be the one to make it to set the rules for that and you want that tone that anyone who works with you is going to gain they're going to be better off than when they first started with you know without you they're going to be better with you and you have to make sure that you focus on that and I, I preach that to a lot of startups and small people who are starting out a lot of times they don't want to partner with people because they're scared of their idea or losing this but it's like it's too hard to get started you need you, you need friends in the industry you need partners who can help you introduce you take you to places help you learn the business yeah and all the business we're getting right now and how we're progressing is really coming from the result of like our relationships we've kept over the last 20 years yeah people are coming out of the woodwork like learning about what we're doing right on our own and they're saying well how can we help or like can you help me because there's a lot of things that we know we've served a lot of people in the industry as we came up and it's only ever done you know a benefit for us as we kind of go forward Mm, speaking of win-win, like that was a huge concept takeaway that I took from uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People yeah. by Stephen Covey. Yeah. And he talks about oh, the win-win well. principle. Yeah. And so, like you said, applying that to business is really what leads to fruitful partnerships when you yeah. find the synergies. I look at it like covalent bonds that are looking to come together. Yeah. And the business you create is the catalyst that the spark gets to happen. Yeah. No, I, I, we, we, I mean, we both, it was, it's, it, both of us did come from the partnership. So we've really brought that into our business and uh, it, we've been able to thrive quickly in a year um, because of people knowing that we want to bring them business and they want to bring us business so that we can both get better together. So let's talk granular about your actual business model with the payment process and stuff. I, I'm not going to say the name because I don't want them to come after me when this gets famous down the road, but I'm dealing with a company called Wipe. And wipe did not, uh, you know, do me too well when they came. wiped you out. Yeah, they wiped me out with the chargeback issues. So, um, can we talk about, you know, like your payment pro, like your actual product, the payment process, and how that goes, and just, you know, ins and outs of it. Yeah. So we do we do really three things. So okay. Like one one of the things is we start with advisement. So we we've been in this payment space and in the banking space for twenty years. So. Um, one thing that's a misconception is banks don't know payments. There's certain banks that know payments. They're called sponsor banks. Mm -hmm. um, but those are banks that work with the acquirers, like the, the, the people that you're talking about. But one key thing about that is we start with advisement. It's like, is this really the right fit? Like, like whether we would work with you, we don't know to try to help you, but we could definitely give you advice toward that. And then if we could help you, we will. If not, we'll at least know somebody who can help you. Then if you can work with us, what we would do is, you know, help you with processing, whether it's acquiring, which is card processing, you know, when you swipe or, you know, put your card in online. Or we also help people create issuance, which is like if, you know, your debit cards that are in your pockets or you might have heard of virtual cards when you go to pay for something online and they spin up that virtual number for you. Um, we work with the processors who, who do all that stuff. And then the last piece I'll let Walt uh, speak to is we do program management, which is really the key to make all of that work. Yeah, so, so. program management is really the, I would just say it's like the oversight to how payment processing is done at these sponsor banks and how they manage to really the operative side of that. Because there's, you know, I would just say there's like eight, eight cornerstone or pillar kind of a components that you have to manage to as a bank, a lot of responsibilities. But because banks aren't really good at payments, they usually bring people or talent in as well as like software products to kind of help manage that. So what we do is Steve and I go into a bank, we say, hey, if you want to become a sponsor bank, 
lots of things you have to do. Let me walk you through the steps. It's more of like a crawl, walk, run approach because banks have these huge amounts of bases of customers and huge commercial customers that they have kind of ignored in the payment space. Let me show you how to actually start addressing those customers' needs directly, giving you a personal touch, but also from a compliance or regulatory standpoint, make sure that you're operating the right way as a bank so that you don't get yourself in trouble from regulators. You're not getting yourself in trouble when it comes to fraud and really kind of help you uh, I would just say focus on how money is actually being driven because these banks don't look at it from a business perspective. They still look at it from like a contemporary bank. I'm trying to avoid risk. I'm trying to avoid, you know, getting caught up doing something incorrectly. And they really look at it from a lending standpoint, not so much as the payment standpoint. They're two different kind of trees of expertise. So we help them bring that in, kind of close the loop and then say, hey, here's how we help you make money. Here's how you do it in an effective way. And you know, here's how you reach out to your customers. You know, when you think about those, when you think about global payments or Stripe, as we mentioned in some of our comments. Swipe. Swipe. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like. <laughs> yeah, sorry. When, when, you, when, you, when you think of those, they have banks behind them. You just don't get to hear about the banks that are there. So those banks that are behind them running those billions and millions of dollars, that's who we work with directly to help them on the program side of how that works because it's very complicated for them and it's making sure that, you know, you're not you're following the regulations and the rules that keep you know the payment system in america and in, in the way it is so yeah you know like if you you know the other day robin our, our buddy right he had fraud happen to his cart but he got the five thousand dollars back you know within an hour of making a phone call that's because of the rules and regulations that we have here so we have to respect them as much as you know they can be annoying at times too so, yeah because yeah. that's where um even even in creating the three-sided marketplace that i was telling you about that's when i started doing research on ebay and how paypal was formed oh, yeah. just from creating a third party um you know platform and things like that so how do you guys compare in what you guys have been able to create in this new business and competing with entities you know like that so we, we really help entities like yourself who want to start that because like, you know, PayPal is now a form of payment that you would take. And, um, you know, so when you build this marketplace is do you want to take MasterCard, Visa, Discover? Do you want to take, you know, who whose cards do you want to process? And do you want to potentially take an ACH payment? Do you want, you know, and all these payments have different things that can affect your business. You know, there's chargebacks, there's fraud mm. which is rampant um you know so you have all those things that you want to affect so that's how we would advise you on you know what's the best way to first of all you want to cut down friction with your users right so how fast can you get the money in the door is the best way always good for you know a cut recurring revenue as well mm -hmm. but then also what's the safest way and then you know what's the way that you could facilitate it so you can build the most growth yeah. for your business if you look at it too like the whole environment's changed especially in the last two three years Cash flow is extremely important now, right? When money was cheap because the Fed didn't offer interest rates that are where we are right now, you could go and offer customers of yours, or like if you're in the manufacturing business, right, you have a distribution chain downstream, you could offer those distributors net 30 terms, and it's not a big of a deal, right? What's net 30? Paying it. Well, yeah, paying accounting term practice, but you know, it's a, you're paying a bill basically within 30 days of the actual receipt, right? So it, now, you know, now cash flow is everything. So if you can get that term down, so let's just say the net five terms, and you get your money, your cash flow back in five days, but you're gonna offer your distributor like a little bit of a discount to do that. Mm -hmm. That's everything now, right? Cash is king right now. And having in the bank is, you know, it makes you more money in return. So it's a different environment than what it was even three years ago, but even 10 years ago in the payments landscape, it was completely different. So everything's always kind of evolving and changing. It's like, can you actually help your customers get into better cash flow position that's a, that's a win-win for your customer yeah. two, two for a question how is interest rates affecting your guys' sector right now today that's my first question y'all can go i'll ask a second one afterwards no let you go with that one yeah i mean actually it's a, it's really good for us right now so even if, with the high, high interest rates absolutely okay yeah. so because they're at the middleman the conduit right right we're acting as a conduit yeah so it's it's great because you have the ability to maybe generate additional margins that you weren't able to do a couple of years back but what you're actually doing in the process is you can keep your margins exactly where they were from a couple of years ago and you're still making the same amount so you can actually offer your customers better more competitive pricing than you could have two three years ago and they're still making the same money now they're getting faster so you're actually helping their business position extremely you know it, it's extremely beneficial for them in the long term mm -hmm. um do i think that'll change i think there's going to be a little bit of you know changes in in the rates that are going to be coming up uh, they kind of led that indication that maybe two or three more cuts this year potentially but i still think that for the overall benefit of the country it's actually good for us to have interest rates that are you know above four and a half five percent 
So when interest rates, you're talking to real estate people here, though, so they may not. Oh yeah, we feel the back. We feel the but exact I, opposite. I, I was like, I'm actually a, a economy was my favorite subject in school, and I understand that you know you give out a lot of money, so you got to raise the interest rates to take it back up. Right. So I understand marketplace movement. So yeah. with that, you know, there's ebbs and flows of creating a yeah. sustainable marketplace. Yeah. yeah, the value of money when when the when money didn't have any value, when we got down to those really low interest rates and money didn't have any value, it actually was worse for a lot of yeah. methods on payments. It also created a lot of business, a lot of lazy businesses got to work that, you know, wouldn't have necessarily thrived in a, in a, in a true economy with a normal, you know, interest rate structure. Interest rate structure. <laughs> so when interest rates are just high and horrible, it sucks for us, but it's great for y'all. But when interest rates are great for us, that's bad for y'all. It's not that it's not, bad, because you're still going to have, yeah, you're still going to have, we're still making the margins, you're still making revenue that you can, potentially in the payment space, even when the interest rates are lower, it's just you feel a lot more compression in our space. Okay. And so what ends up happening is that people are offering bottom dollar pricing, they're not making any margins, so what you're actually doing is you're hurting your own ecosystem by making it a race to the bottom. Mm. Yeah. yeah like lower 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 because right, yeah, right. <laughs> that's what i was going to ask too like my as a business owner when i look at what wipes or anything else that i use i look at the percentage that they charge and to your point you know it's one of them i think well i don't want to say their name either but it rounds with sound um that you know it has low low fees of how to move and transact the funds and um especially compared to some of the other third-party entities and so that's what it's like are they competing to get lower oh, and lower and lower and what does that mean to the market yeah. to compete and stay competitive in the rates that it costs to transact the money yeah. there's a lot of people a lot of processors in general that'll say it's a race to the bottom right so they'll try to give you on paper the lowest contract or interest rate amount you know that you'll be paying for fees but the reality is what they're doing is they're hiding it in other service areas and and so you're actually still paying what is the market average oh, tomato tomato junk, junk fees and junk stuff like that fees. we spend a lot of time on transparency so that's what we're really trying to do is you know help you know, we're always advising our companies to you know like where can they make more money where do they need to pay these fees because sometimes you, you just need to pay those fees because those fees are keeping you safe they're keeping you away from fraud there there's reasons for some of those services and then there's other things where it could there could be you know people gouging you or just you know just taking advantage of your lack of knowledge of the payment space because you know the one thing we always tell everybody is Payments are hard. And anybody who tells you payments are easy, I would be weary. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the first sign you should walk away from that person. Okay. About payments are not easy. They're complicated, but you can figure them out. Even if they say it on the website, payments made easy, just scratch them. Get out, get out of here, y'all. I know the truth about you. <laughs> but you bring up a good point, not just to shop for the rate because they're going to hide it somewhere else. So you might as well, because I'm not going to lie, there's no uh, customer service. Because it, then it was like a transaction that literally they put the money in my account and they took it back out, I issued a refund, but then it was like a dollar and some change missing. Right. And I'm like, I don't know what, there's no explanation of where that went. There's no customer service. And I get it's a small, just a dollar. But on the large scale, if I make it now a wire and there's a, a small increment amount missing and there's no accountability for it, because I literally got the money in and sent a refund, but then it was like, it, it, it wasn't matching up. And it was like, wait, that makes me think about the protections that you get. And yeah. now it's like, mm, what did I get by not paying you the fees? <laughs> we, we were literally just talking to a company the other day that they're doing over 200 million a year in, in, in processing, swore they were paying 1.9%. That's what they thought their average rate would come down to. Um, they were paying 3.2%. Mm. So when we got through their statement, went through their statement, analyzed their statement, showed them all that, they understood that completely but that's the misconception because the posted rate is not necessarily the rate so that's where we wanted to come in and you know bring a lot of transparency and those yeah. bills are hard to read like i don't blame any business owner who can't necessarily read those bills you need to bring in people who understand how to read those bills i mean i, I struggle hard with them um and we, we bring in experts on our side too yeah wow. so you guys are primarily in the b2b space yes primarily yeah. what is your and uh, what does your customer your ideal customer look like uh, our ideal customer is, you know, well, fintech. We've been moving down, but, but you know, into uh, fifty million to two billion customers. We go into some some smaller too, but we really been looking at uh, mid tier to small businesses, SMBs that have been out there. That you know, what really does SMB stand for? So small businesses. So basically, uh, we've been looking at. Uh, how to help them because a lot of times, like you know, in our in our former life, we worked with, you know the large insurance companies of the world that we can't name 
very large soda companies you might know out of this city, stuff like that. And so those guys are always going after payment people to learn the better ways. How can it help? And but the thing is, is the, these guys who are running really good businesses and they maybe started out as mom and pop shops, but now they've got big and they got 20 locations, different things like that. They they need advice too. It's just, they fundamentally didn't grow up like paying for that or helping for that. When you're in a corporation, you always think of bringing in advisors. So it's a different, so we're trying to offer our advising services at slim to no charges. And then let's go make money together when we build a revenue stream that can work. So like mm. we, we try to, you know, we start out with the advisement piece first and then see if we can help you. And if we can't help you, we can. If we can figure out a way for both of us to save you money and all of us make money, let's see if we can do that together. So you offer your products to small businesses, right? But then you also offer a white label version of your products to banks, right? Has there ever been a conflict of interest where like a bank has the product that you're offering them and then you're coming in and saying, well, we can do that too? Like with your customer base? No, we really went work that way. The, the okay. products that we're offering to the bank, the banks are, we're actually helping banks facilitate that to small businesses or mid-tier businesses. So okay. we're just creating another avenue, another vehicle that small businesses can get to the better payment options. Okay, so it's all, it's all ties back to you regardless if it comes from a bank or direct. Right. right. Gotcha, gotcha. And more often than not, what we actually end up seeing is that Again, yeah, because banks have not been taught over the last 40, 50 years to actually understand payments. Mm -hmm. They've been taught to buy products off the shelf from like four major vendors in the US. So they don't know anything about it, right? So when we're able to bring payments to a bank level first, and then we say, hey, bank, you have, you know, you're a commercial bank, right? Small community bank, but you're a commercial bank. You have 500 businesses already in your portfolio. If you go look at those businesses' statements, they're most likely going to someone that rhymes with, you know, it's wipe or something like that. You, that's your customer base right there. Go back to your customer base and help service them better. They're going to have better attraction to stay with you as you know their primary bank or financial institution if you can give them these services. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What about, um, we talked a lot about your American imprint. What about global impact? Because the financial infrastructure to a lot of up and coming countries or countries that are growing and expanding, they could use you know this assistance in this financial infrastructure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we uh, have made some good friends through this. Uh, you know, our former company, we started out doing a lot of cross-border payments. Um, so when you get into the, the cross-border payments, all the international mechanisms, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we, we have 50 states, but all the rules are the same, you know, like you can go from one country to another country and in the EU, that's pretty easy. But so that's kind of set and you can kind of figure that out. But, you know, Africa or Latam, you can, you know, very different rules from country to country. So you know, and, and there's people that you need to help facilitate. So uh, it's much different because there's a currency play between the currency exchanges. So you have to be very careful of, you know, US dollar compared to, you know, um, even the Euro or, you know, like when you're looking at crypto because crypto is popular in other countries because of, you know, it, if, if you're in here. Venezuela yeah. or Brazil, you don't know if the money's gonna have the value the next day and where crypto could actually be safer in some regards. So crypto is a real payment form where in the US it's, a, you know, it's kind of, we're trying to figure it out. It's a touch taboo, but it's not like that internationally. It's actually quite a big player in the market stream. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned it's more stable markets. I would think it more, you know, especially getting around halving time. Like you look one day, you got a thousand dollars in your account. The next day it's only worth $60 because yeah. of, you know, people trying to buy it up and yeah. lower the price. Yeah. So I was very concerned with how that works internationally because those values can be so like, we feel it in America, not so much. I mean, even though it's drastic, but in other countries, if that's what they're depending on for peer to peer transaction, I mean, you just sent me 50 bucks and the next day is it's the, the value changed. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's incredible. I mean, we, we're working on a loan deal um, in an African country and, you know, they were the loan ratios were seven to ten dollars a week. Like so, you know, we, we also lose perspective of that actually matters to a lot of people in a lot of other countries, you know, and getting them that seven to ten dollars a week is a lifeline mm. versus here to lunch. So it's kind of cool working on projects. Or Starbucks like coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, Those it's prices keep going up. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned crypto and all that. I'm not sure if you guys keep up with like Ripple and all that, but um, they passed a court case uh, earlier this year where they now announced that it is now a security, no, no longer a commodity. And then on top of that, that I think I believe the end of this year or next year, all the banks have to be ISO 22 compliant when it comes to trading and using Ripple. 
is that with all these regulation stuff that's happening is that something that you guys are preparing for or is this affecting you guys at all like how is this news yeah. and crypto affecting yeah. y'all space I'll, I'll, I'll do the ISO 2022 yeah so I think the, the ISO standard that's coming to play also has a, a couple different impacts for something called Basel 3 which is you know, a, a accounting and finance methodology that banks have to apply to or adhere to mm -hmm. I think the U.S. what you'll end up finding is that the U.S. is going to push back as long as possible to have these adoptions in place because then there's more accountability which then means there's more cost structure for how these banks operate mm -hmm. Uh, that all being said, I think outside the United States, it's extremely important to be able to have these standards when you think about uh, commodities or forex exchanges. You know, like um, in foreign exchange, com you know, po uh, components or brokerages that are out there. So uh, I think it's good for the rest of the world. I don't know if it's necessarily great for the U.S. just yet. That all being said, I think it does open up a lot of opportunities for people to look at how they securitize themselves, uh, whether it's crypto or you're going into a commodities market of some sort. Um, it does lean itself to a lot more security for an individual consumer um, and puts a lot more responsibility on brokerage houses, banks, things of that nature. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. It's a lot like your business in real estate, right? It mm -hmm. depends when you buy. You know, if you if you buy high and then the neighborhood changes and, you know, you might be stuck with that for a minute, yep. right? Which is, you know, kind of like crypto. <laughs> if, you, if you buy wrong, you could be stuck with it for a minute. But um, we're a little fortunate over here that the U.S. dollar is so strong that you know we don't have to do crypto i mean a lot of the countries we're talking about they almost have to do crypto in some regards gotcha gotcha so let's take it back because i know we, we can geek out on this stuff but let's take it back to getting that first yes from i don't know if it was an investor or a bank for your very first products how was that conversation journey how did that go for y'all it was it was uh it was pretty cool i mean we actually you know we uh we were working on the idea. So like, you know, you, you think you have the idea and like, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize is when they're first starting out is you're going to change that idea over and over again, or at least pivot. I think, yeah, right. <laughs> I, think I think you, I, I recommend that you do pivot and you do advance your idea because mm -hmm. a lot of people who don't, though they're in the, they're not usually the guys that are, you're talking to too much about their success. So mm -hmm. I think you have to constantly do that. And the first deal we went to was an actual former banker that we used to work with. And, um, he's like, man, I, I think I got something you guys can help us out on. And then, you know, we started working it and, you know, started going down the road of, uh, uh getting into property management, uh, mm -hmm. deals. So that's really like the first deal we signed, which is kind of key to your world is, uh, you know, helping, uh, smaller, uh, companies that are, you know, might have a part one or two apartment complexes, helping them take, you know, rent in via debit card, credit card, ACH. Um, in a timely way and in a, in a cost effective way. So that was the that was the, the first deal that we were able to really get in, work on, get closed, really show that, you know, we could we could bring our skills to the table to really save them money and allow them to actually go out and resell what, the, the plan that we put together and save even these other companies money. So um, we we're pretty excited about it. OK, so what was twofold? What was one of your best deals, clients that you guys closed on with your payment processing solutions? And then what was one of your horror stories? One that's just like, oh, I, I wish we could just remove this one from the belt. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I'll, I'll let Walt tell the good. I'll, <laughs> I'll let Walt tell the good story because I'll, I'll tell the bad one because I got to modify it for him. <laughs> yeah, we we got working on a government deal mm. that that was hard, and you know whether it was. It was hard to tell it was a uh, special ops kind of things and it was it was really complicated to kind of figure out was this really a real deal or was it fraud and you know it took a lot of our time and it seemed kind of real and then you met people and you thought like oh maybe it's not and so you know the one thing about the payments business is there is a lot of bad actors in it and so you just have to be really careful about who you go down and you know how they can really you can spend your time in in the wrong areas and you you know end up chasing your tail instead of really chasing real revenue and good deals but at the fundamental is when when you feel it questionable in your in in your soul then it's the time to walk away and that's what we did so that was the, that was a deal that we should have walked away from probably the first week and not the ninth week <laughs> but did you feel it somewhere in your gut that maybe you shouldn't have done it we didn't do the deal and you know we 
or yeah. go, I shouldn't have gone that far. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Because because yeah. now you know me me going through the whoa, ups, ebbs and flows of entrepreneurship. You know, I had some situations happen, and my mentors told me to get out of it sooner than later. And I was like, no, I'm gonna hold on. I was like Titanic, like I'm gonna play and pill. <laughs> and ultimately, when you know things did finally the dust settled, I was like, I should have got off when she said to get off. No, totally. So it's like, how do you determine sticking it out? And the value of sticking something through, like you determined in 2008, and it wound up being a win versus, no, my gut told me I should have walked away and not spent so much time. Yeah, I, I got to say, I, I work on it all the time. My wife reminds me of it all the time, too, is, you know, really do work on uh, failing fast and, you know, want to get better at it all the time. Um, this was a true mistake where I think we really knew. And, you know, we didn't want to fail fast because we just we, we also have that, you know, you grow up where, hey, you know, you got to be tough. You got to fight for these deals, you know, everything, you know, don't let anybody beat you. And um, so sometimes that's not good. You got to really make sure that you're aligning everything with how you're aligned too, because if it doesn't feel right. You, you know it doesn't yeah work. and i love that word alignment because yeah. alignment a lot of people that we interview um they are people with strong goals with strong a north star and it seems like like you said you can easily decide left or right well where does it align with where i'm going yeah, yeah. so what was the sticking point to make to make this deal a no deal just so i what was like the uh, the turn off for this specific deal when, when we yeah so as soon as when we really did learn that you know th this wasn't it was really a ruse. It, it wasn't what they said it was, gotcha. and 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 it, and it was fraud. Okay, oh, gotcha. so, oh, you know, gotcha. So, gotcha. so we didn't, um, you know, once we once we knew that, but we probably knew that before. I mean, these guys were really good at, you know, I mean, there's government documents. I mean, this was a high level fraud scheme. Gotcha. Like, wow. I mean, like I'm talking documents, passports, fake, intricate stuff. Like, gotcha. Intricate. Like, like, if you could spend that much time to do it the wrong way with all the layers, how much could we have set up doing it the right way? Yeah, I, I always think about that. I was like, you know, tell, I was like, criminals, if they just did, they put half that effort into any normal business, they'd be successful. You with passports that go, everything. Goodness. So what's the good story? Let's hear this. The good story is it's, it's almost finished. We're not there quite there yet. But okay. We're at the I would say one yard line with this one. one okay. Actually, it's another government deal. Mm -hmm. Um a real one. A real one. This time. <laughs> We've actually met all the players. We've gone to Washington, D.C. to actually meet with people. So um, this opportunity is something that actually came from our network, people that Steve actually directly helped and I helped a little bit as well uh, in our past. The opportunity is uh, to start off with, it's 150 to $200 million a month in processing. Wow. That's just kind of the infancy step. Yeah, right? that's just, let's try it. We're yeah. going to do a trial run, it's a and trial we're only going to give you $150 million a month to right. start, it's a, it's a, to transact. It's $150 million a month just to kind of like, it's, that's their proof of concept stage. Wow. Right? So the, the government's obviously very, very smart about how they go ahead and look at contractors and, you know, potential new things they want to bring to the table. Um, the proof of concept runs for a year just to start off with that's uh 200,000 users that they have they're going to be coming through our our platform and uh the potentiality of that actually jumps from 150 million to 200 million dollars a month to um, top line is like about 28 billion dollars wow so those are kind of numbers you when you look at it it sounds almost a little ridiculous but the, that's a small drop of the bucket for yeah. the government their yeah. budget that we're talking about just this one individual department group is 600 billion dollars a year yeah oh. So they're just doing a trial. They're doing a trial. Yeah. yeah. Got you. But the, you know these deals, you we, we you know we have other people tell stories. They worked on them for five, and you know, I mean, this guy has been working on this deal for you know over five years, and he brought us in the last year. Oh wow! To help him, um, wow. To close it there are, to there are talk about alignment. Talk about y'all came in just and were like, hey, we the right players to get you across the finish line. Let's go. And yeah. it, but it comes from you know the things that Steve and I did to help this uh, to help this guy out in his earlier on in his career with one of his businesses. So, so the value of relationship value and of it's coming to I because I look at it all like a seed and it comes to bear fruit. And this is the time you have somebody working four years so that you can come in and just take it across the finish line. That's amazing. But we did wow. we did a lot, you know, like I you know. I, I helped him out a lot with, you know, certain things, jumped on calls for him, talked to people, helped him facilitate things and never knew where it would go. Yeah. But I'm just a huge believer in that. You just got to give back relationship. And if you give back. It, it all comes back around to you. And I've been very fortunate like that in my career. I've always tried to help people in any way we any way we can. And we do it now together yep. with anything that we can do. Actually, I just uh, agreed to uh, a, a board uh, helping helping an entrepreneur last night. I'm going to help. You know, help advise her, and uh, we're wow. meeting. We're meeting next week, and 
Wow. You know, I, I love it. That's why I love everything that uh, Jay Bailey's doing at the. Oh, yeah, the Rice Center. Right? Yeah. I'm speaking there Friday. Oh, yeah. um, on, uh, they're having a brunch series with women. And I'm, I'm one of the hosts. I love it. I love Jay what they're and I doing. Went to high school together, so, Are you yeah. serious? Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. Oh, so I got a couple other questions to ask you. We'll talk about <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> he's, he's, he's an awesome human. Oh, yeah, he is amazing. He's like, Hopefully, we can have him on the show. We yeah, have yeah, to tap you to get him he's over special. here. He's special. He's special. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's take it back. So, obviously, big company payment process and huge stuff before corporate world were you guys ever in corporate at any point or how did that look yeah i, I was yeah. in corporate for uh let's see here 12 years 12 years okay yeah 12 years and, and mainly that was at a company called jack henry where i kind of rose the ranks uh i built a program for them that is called their vendor integration program almost 20 years ago but all that was was actually to cultivate relationships with you know at the time steve's company which was called gzio and so um Built that, managed for nine years, did really well, kind of grew the co corporate ladder. And then I wanted to go international. So I wanted to actually focus on like credit bureau data and credit monitoring services. I worked for an Italian national company, which was great. I mean, they had me over in Bologna, Italy once a quarter. So it was really <laughs> horrible, right? And staying at a resort and stuff like that was great. And the family got to come too? Yeah, yeah, of course. It was like, company you know, trip. Yeah, whatever, right. Um, did that. And then the last, before I joined Steve at a company called Move Financial, I was the chief product officer at a company called Nexoft. And where we built platforms for banks, credit unions, uh, loan origination systems—you know everything you possibly think of that is the fintech ecosystem, if you will. Okay. Wow! Like, uh, let me ask you this because I know you probably are. Have you ever read The Alchemist? Oh my! I've not read The Alchemist. <laughs> have it's you read it? It's my list. Uh -huh. You you've read it? All right, I haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> okay, right I'm sorry. Okay, we'll go back. We'll go back to it. I think that's gonna be every question, every episode now. <laughs> And, and everything of what you're saying, that's what makes me so excited. I love the book. I read it when I was in um, early on in my journey in my career. And it's about understanding how every piece of the puzzle prepares you for the moment you are now. Yeah. And so just hearing about all the experiences that you've had, how it's a great accompaniment to what he's doing. And you didn't even know that all this was brewing. And the answer is like Jeopardy. Like the answer is his name, but it's like, well, what's the question? And you're seeking the question and going through your journey and how they collide and create this beautiful thing. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I love that, too. I mean, we we, you know, and you don't know, too, all the way all the ways you can work to, you know, how you'll work together either. Like when, you know, you've been friends, you've worked in businesses together, you've worked as partnerships. I mean, we had a good idea, but um, it's been really great how we work together. I you know, know, our skill sets are. Uh, complimentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I feel it. I, that's why I'm like, oh my gosh, he has everything. You need. <laughs> but if you, I mean, because I know he was, he was asking the question for you too. I didn't, I didn't want to stop the flow, but I just got so excited. <laughs> so corporate experience on your end yeah. prior to the transition to entrepreneurship. Yeah, a corporate experience for me was amazing. I had, I had some really great managers, mm -hmm. um, all female. So I will say they were, they were. <laughs> Who run the world? Yeah, they girls. Were, yes. They were badass, and uh, they uh, really coached and helped me a lot. Really learn process. So I think you know, big companies are great at learning process. They're frustrating as hell at learning process too, because um, sometimes you know you get into having conference calls to set up another conference call. Yep. But if you're actually doing productive stuff and that, I wasn't really built for that. You know, it was it was tough for me um, because like you know once they started putting a lot of rules around that didn't make any sense. I have a lot of trouble with that stuff. It's like let's go do productive things. Let's, yeah. You know, let's make smart decisions and. Or if we're making a bad, let's make it fast and get over it and then move on to a smart decision. So I just, it was hard at companies to kind of, you know, stick down that road. And that's why, like, when we exited, I didn't go to a big company. I went I went to another startup. Mm -hmm. So that's just more of my speed. And I like building. Yeah, because that's that's one of the things I learned. Like when we come in as employees, you're joining a company from 50 to 100. But that zero to one, <laughs> that zero to one is really what tests the faith and the measure of what you're building. Yeah, so Missing paychecks. <laughs> you know, like that's a, we, we did a lot of that in you know my first company. I mean, and Walt, did it, Walt and I did that for the last year, too. I mean, when you miss, an, when you miss a paycheck and you got to get up the next day and go work just as hard, and then you miss a paycheck the next month and you still know, like, you have no decision but to get up and go grind and make it happen, then you really learn what you're about. You become yeah. humble really quick to the process. Yeah, that's why, that's why I love the soft skills that get developed in these times. What um, what, is, what is the hobby? What is the, the, we take the business off? What is it that we like to do? <laughs> yeah, I got to get better at that, I think. So, uh, <laughs> Well, now uh, my wife has me working out, so I, I just that's where I met Errol. So uh, oh, nice. I, I am getting back into fitness, so that's that's kind of cool. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm yeah, getting past the, the consistency. Getting fun. 
Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I, I I'm really social, so I just I, I like being around people. Okay. So that, that's that's probably my greatest that my my best hobby. I need to work on hobby. <laughs> I work too much. That. He's being really passionate <laughs> about that. We like to have parties, like hey, you know, entertain people, and have family and friends come in because our big thing is also we like to give, we're both givers. So we like to both cook actually a lot. Yeah. Now. We're both on diets at the moment. <laughs> well, you can find creative. You know what? When I did my 90 day no meat, I found creative ways because the part of the going vegan was like, oh, am I going to be eating grass? Yeah. But we found creative. Like we found ways to make tacos out of peanuts and cilantro and lettuce wraps. Yeah. And so is is you can get creative, especially if you like to cook. Yeah, yeah. there was actually a really good cookbook I could recommend. It's called Thug Kitchen. Oh. It's for vegetarians. It's fantastic. I may have to try that because I like new ideas, experiences, and things like that. We yeah. just circle back on that tacos out of peanut butter. What, what was it? Oh yeah, to, uh, peanuts. You crush them with onion, cilantro, and a whole bunch of. We're gonna talk about this. Yeah. Too, too, too. <laughs> it's really tasty. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's very cool. So entrepreneur tendencies to happen. So let's talk. Like if an entrepreneur wanted to start off in either the fintech or payment processing realm, what would be some tips, tricks, advice that you would give for someone who's looking to do that? Uh, definitely understand your 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 payment flows mm -hmm. like you know like you know wh where are all the methods like you know not just your incoming money but also your payables so a lot of a lot of companies focus on just the inbound and they don't focus on the outbound there's a lot of ways to make money off your payables um and a lot of people you know give that to uh ill.com and stuff of these other other things that rhyme with that and, and they just give that stuff away um there's a lot of ways to really you know make money through your payments and I, I would just think about it on all levels before you just dive in and say oh i need this because i just need to get off the ground payments is just always going to be an expense i don't need to put any trouble but along those lines i would say the same thing is as a lot of people think that they can just go get one or two developers and go build payments you that's not a good way to go either you really payments you either go all in or you don't and most people it's just a it's a part of their business it's not the valuation of their business the valuation of their business is what they do well with their main thing so i would tell them just find people who really understand the business so that you can get the best deals for yourself and you can really get the best advice most importantly yeah nice i'd back that up with the saying the other thing that you want to look at is there's with I think everyone focuses right now on disruption, right? What mm -hmm. industry can I disrupt? How can I make it better, faster, stronger, et cetera? Same thing happens with payments. There's just more problems in that life cycle, the, the, the ecosystem of itself, right? And so if you're focusing on one thing that you really understand, you want to kind of fix that one thing, be really passionate about that one thing. You don't have to tackle all of it all at once. That comes, I think, with time. You can learn that. But really be focused on the one thing you want to be able to help fix and just drive after that. Continue to drive after that. Okay. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find us at uh, nextmoves.io. Uh, N X T M O V E S, nextmoves.io. Yeah. yeah, and then on LinkedIn, uh, we're always happy to, you know, hit me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm the only Steve Negri on LinkedIn. So, I mean, one thing about having a last <laughs> that name is like unique. You should, you should do that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you can't find me, you're not trying too hard if you're spelling my name right. So, <laughs> the only one. Wow. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, part and tips before we conclude what would be one or two entrepreneur traits or habits that you guys picked up in your journeys that was pivotal? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go for it, sir. Uh, uh, Stephen touched on it a little bit here with a the deal we didn't do, but mm -hmm. falling, uh, failing fast. Failing fast. I think it's extremely important to understand, you know, when you're looking at either it's a new opportunity, it's a deal for you to make money or revenue, but if it doesn't fit right in your business model, that thing, like I just talked about, that one problem, you know, you want to solve, if it's, you know, ancillary to it, it's on the outskirts, you don't really understand it that well, then maybe that's not the thing for you. Okay. And be humble in that process too. It's okay if you fail fast, just know, recognize that, you know, that's something that you have to do as an entrepreneur, because it allows you then to put focus back where you want to go. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the two things I would, I would I would really say is that, you know, you you have to you have to really focus on this. This isn't something you can. It's too competitive in our world today for you to kind of have one foot in the water and, and, and not do it. If you do, you, you might make it for a while, but you really have to focus and figure out like, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work until it's, the work's done. I'm going to get up and, you know, it might be a Sunday morning, but I have to go take my time to do this. And I think, you know, just have to realize what you're taking on. It's a lot of fun. I love it. It's, you know, what I love to do, but I think there's a lot of focus. And then I think something that I'll actually, you know, parlay off what Dee Dee said when she was on your your podcast is 
you don't ever know who when you're talking to somebody you don't ever know what they're what you can do for them or what they can do for you yeah. and you know really go in and treat everybody you know with respect and you know humility and you know see like what it is you know can you two find a connection together and maybe it's just that you're just good humans maybe it's some people are not and you know you know to work a work away from them faster and but a lot of times if you're open to it you just find these connections with people that you never knew could come around or grow and uh, we have a lot of business deals going that way now because we were really just open to Hey, you know, is there a way for us to figure out how to work together? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. This has been an amazing episode um, to really explore what it's like in the world of like you're talking about seven, eight, nine figure deals. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Definitely. Well, Jessica. Well, thanks for tuning in to another episode of All Things Entrepreneur. Be sure to like and subscribe for more information like this to our YouTube channel. As always, you know, you got it. Let's get it. Let's, Let's go. go. <laughs>